Welcome to our third season here at Voices of Customer Experience podcast. We're so excited to be back, as always, bringing you the very best thought leaders and practitioners of customer experience and its overlapping verticals, such as marketing, analytics, behavior economics, journey mapping, and design. Our goal is to help you be better at your job by listening to the experiences and leadership of others who, like you, have dedicated their careers to improving the dialogue between companies and customers. We have an all-star lineup this season, so make sure not to miss a single episode. Voices of Customer Experience is brought to you by Worthix, the first and only self-adaptive survey for measuring customer experience. Discover your worth at worthix.com. Daybear has spent 25 years in digital marketing and customer experience, consulting for more than 700 companies during that period, including 34 of the Fortune 500. His current firm, Convince & Convert, provides word of mouth, digital marketing, and customer experience advice and counsel to some of the world's most important brands. Jay's Convince & Convert blog was named the world's number one content marketing blog by the Content Marketing Institute and is visited by more than 250,000 marketers each month. Jay also hosts and produces the Social Pros podcast, which is downloaded 65,000 times monthly and was named the best marketing podcast by the Content Marketing Awards. He also has a weekly talk trigger show on the topic of his new book by the same name, which is featured on YouTube and as a podcast. And how are you, Jay? I am living the dream. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Let's do this thing. Great. Awesome. Well, today I wanted to have you on to talk a little bit about your newest book that you uh, co-wrote with um, Daniel Lemon. Is that it? Yep, it is. Daniel Lemon. Awesome. And the book is called Talk Triggers. Um, Tell me a little bit about what inspired you to write this book and, and tell me what Talk Triggers are. So I, you know, I, all the books that I've written kind of come from the same place, which is uh, in our consulting firm, we work with a number of, of corporate clients from around the world on, on marketing and customer experience related issues. And, and when I see a pattern of questions emerge from those clients, I think, huh, this question needs to, to be answered in some way. And in this case, uh, people kept asking myself and my team, you know, we have a pretty good handle on the mechanics of uh, social media, the mechanics of content marketing, or, or in some cases, even the mechanics of CX, but we're not really sure what to say. And I thought, geez, if, if some of these biggest companies in the world don't really know what story they're trying to tell, like how does anybody know what story they're trying to tell? And, and it started to do some additional research on this topic and, and realized that you know, word of mouth is the original marketing, right? It's the thing that cavemen used to recruit customers. Uh, and, and here we are thousands of years later, and nobody has a strategy, right? You, you've got a content strategy, a marketing strategy, digital strategy, social strategy, CX strategy, perhaps, uh, but nobody has a word of mouth strategy. We, we just take it for granted. And and we said, geez, this, this can't be true, uh, that, that we just kind of treat word of mouth as something that will happen inexorably because it won't. You have to give your customers a story to tell. So that's why we wrote the book, to give people a, a framework and a formula for doing just that. Great. And what do you consider to be a talk trigger? A talk trigger is defined as a strategic operational choice that you make in your business that customers notice and talk about. Mm -hmm. It's something that you do differently, not something that you say differently. And even though we consistently say word of mouth marketing, a talk trigger isn't really marketing. It really is a CX initiative. It really is an operational decision that, of course, yields marketing advantages. But it's not marketing in the classic sense, right? It's not a it's not a price or a promotion or a coupon or a contest. Uh, it's not a Facebook page. It it is something that you do differently every day that customers are compelled to discuss. Um, so it's it's very planned. It's it's very it's something mm-hmm. thought up and and strategically executed within your organization to get people get buzz going around your business somehow. Yes, absolutely. It's something that you do on purpose every day, every time that people don't expect. And because they don't expect it, when they encounter it, they encounter that element of your customer experience. Like, wow, I have to tell my friends about this. One of the greatest talk triggers examples, at least longest running talk triggers examples are, are, is Double Tree Hotels. Mm-hmm. Double Tree by Hilton gives every guest when they check in a warm chocolate chip cookie. 
And they've been doing this every day for 30 years. Today and every day, they will deliver to their guests about 75,000 chocolate chip cookies. And they're delicious. And they're delicious. And Daniel and I did a bunch of research on this particular point, and we interviewed hundreds of Doubletree guests. And we discovered that 34% of them, more than a third, have told a story to somebody else about that cookie. Well, I've told this story on the air like hundreds of times already. So <laughs> See, there you go. So that proves the point. When you, when you do the math on that, what it means is that approximately 22,500 times a day, that talk trigger creates conversations. Now, on a related front, when's the last time you saw a Doubletree ad? Right. Uh, never. Not very often, if ever, because the cookie is the ad and the guests are the sales and marketing department. See, the, Robert Stevens, who founded Geek Squad, said something once that, that is extraordinarily powerful and important. It's not 100% true, but it's true enough. And what Robert said was advertising is a tax paid by the unremarkable. Hmm. And when you, have a, when you have a talk trigger that works, your customers grow your business for you. And I've been doing this for 30 years. I can tell you that the best way to grow any business is for your customers to grow it for you. So you've been a marketer around the same amount of time that uh, Doubletree has been giving out their cookie. Yes. No, Um, that is a coincidence. uh, But but yes, that is. But if we take it all the way back, did Doubletree do this deliberately? Like, was this planned? Did did somebody get together and like say, you know what, we'll give a cookie and then people will talk about us? Or is it something that just kind of happened organically? In their case... It's a little bit of both. Hmm. You know, they, they, and I, I interviewed their CMO about the history of it. It used to be actually turned down service. They used to do it in the room, but then they realized it made a lot more sense to do it uh, when people walk in. Right. And so certainly they thought it was just a nice gesture, but more importantly, it ties into their brand position, which is the warm welcome. One of the ways that they distinguish themselves because you know there's 14 brands in the Hilton portfolio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you got the Conrad, you got regular Hilton, you have DoubleTree, Hilton Garden Inn, Hampton Inn, blah 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 blah. And, and they all have to have their own brand position, otherwise they're competing for the same guests, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So they each have their own they each have their own shtick, right? So DoubleTree's deal is the warm welcome. They want to own that seven, eight minutes between when you set foot on the property and when you set foot in your room. Consequently, they spend more time and money on lobby design than most brands at that price point, and they spend more time and money on training the front desk staff than most hotels at that price point. And the cookie presentation ceremony, and it really is a ceremony, is a big part of that, right? Warm cookie, warm welcome. It all kind of makes sense together. Now, did they sit down 30 years ago and say, what we need is a word of mouth strategy? No, I think it was more instinctual than that. Uh, but I think that's partially because while there's been a lot of good books about word of mouth over the years, nobody, at least until Daniel and I put together talk triggers, has said, here's the framework. Here's exactly how you do it. There's a lot of great books out there that say word of mouth's important. You should get some. Right. And I don't disagree. But nobody said, and here's exactly how you do it, which is why most of the great word of mouth successes of the last 30 years have been somewhat accidental uh, and not nearly enough strategic, which is why what we really hope to have have added to the conversation is here's how you go make a proactive on purpose word of mouth strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, talking about that deliberate design, you say in the book that a talk trigger should be or must be remarkable, relevant, reasonable, and repeatable, Mm -hmm. right? Those are the four R's that you have to have. Can we go down that list and talk a little bit about each of the aspects. So when you talk about being remarkable, I mean, you just said a couple of minutes ago that advertising is the tax you pay for being unremarkable, Mm -hmm. right? Which fits perfectly into this. And um, in your book, you say that the definition of remarkable is worthy of notice. And I think that that's really important. It's something that makes people stop and say, oh, so it's a little bit out of the ordinary and it it causes that impression. It causes people to stop and look, right? Absolutely. And then and then discuss as well. A lot of times people will create a proposed talk trigger. That's fine, right? But but good is a four letter word when it comes to word of mouth. Competency does not create conversation. We think it does. And this is one of the great problems with word of mouth strategy today is that we think, well, if we just run a good business, if we just execute well, people will talk about that. 
but they don't. Mm-hmm. Like if I go if I go over the corner right now and I flick a switch and the lights come on, that's really competent. Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to have a conversation about that because I expect that to happen. I expect the food to be good in a restaurant. Right. Right. I, I expect service to be at least average or above average. And so if you want to actually shock people out of their malaise and catalyze conversations, you have to do something that they don't expect, something they didn't see coming. And, and a lot of people's uh, attempts to generate word of mouth just don't just don't do that. Right. It's just like same as lame. All of your competition is good. Everybody's trying to do the same thing. You just have to build something into your CX that people don't see coming. Right. Well, we live in a world right now that's very social. I mean, you know, people say that, oh, nobody talks to each other anymore. That's not true. I feel like the communication channels are so much easier and so much more accessible, but everybody talks about everything. And the truth is, I think that people want something to talk about. They want an interesting story to tell their date or their spouse or their friends when they meet up with them. So the truth is that people are, I feel like people are actually looking for interesting things along the course of their day that can later become a story. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, I completely agree. And and that's really what we're, what we're, what we're trying to achieve here is that, um, I mean, there's a difference between, between proactive and reactive word of mouth. What we're shooting for here is proactive word of mouth, which is where your customer introduces the notion of your product, service, or brand into conversations. Mm -hmm. It's the difference between somebody walking up to you at a party and saying, you're just kind of chit-chatting, like, you know what's cool? I was in Atlanta, and I went to the Doubletree Hotel, and they gave me this amazing cookie. That's proactive word of mouth, as opposed to being in a conversation where somebody says, hey, I've got to book a hotel. Anybody have any recommendations? And you say, oh, you know what? Doubletree is good because of this cookie. Right? Right. Both are important, right? But when you can kind of cross that chasm from, from reactive word of mouth, circumstantial word of mouth, to proactive word of mouth, where your customers are dying to tell somebody about this thing, that's when you really have it linked. Right. I'll, give it, I'll give an example. I just rolled this out this week for my own business. As you may know, uh, when I give presentations, I am known as the crazy plaid suit guy. Uh I have lots and lots and lots of increasingly garish plaid suits. It is my thing. (laughs) So for audience members, that is a bit of a talk trigger because they probably have not seen a professional speaker dressed just like that in the past. But audience members aren't really my customer in the classic sense. Very important, of course. But it's not really my customer. So my team and I have been working on a talk trigger for our core customer, which are meeting planners. So now what happens is when you have me uh, come speak to your event, uh, a week before the event, we send you a link, which is dressjbear.com. And you go to this web app that we built, and it allows you to select what suit I'm going to wear. And then it sends you sends you an instant confirmation, and then it actually drops that information onto my calendar so that the day before when I'm packing for the event, I know what suit to bring. We just tried it out this week, and it was so effective that people were tweeting about it. The CEO of the company mentioned it in my introduction when he <laughs> called me up on stage. I'm like, okay, my work here is done. <laughs> Mission accomplished. That's great. <laughs> I love that. But again, that's not marketing, right? It's an operational decision that creates a marketing advantage. Yeah. Moving on to the next R, which is relevant. Mm-hmm. I cannot tell you how many times I've seen, you know, the classic example that you give in your book, which is, you know, win an iPad <laughs> or even better, my all time favorite, an Amazon gift card. <laughs> And I'm a marketer myself. And the amount of times that I've had people pitch me the idea of why don't we just give people an Amazon gift card is more than I can count. So having whatever it is that you do be relevant to your line of business, that for me is, I mean, really important. Well, look, we're not talking about creating attention for attention's sake. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but it's not a word of mouth strategy, right? That's a publicity stuff. Those aren't the same thing. You know, there's a Venn diagram there where they overlap a little bit, but a publicity stunt and a, and a defined, consistent word of mouth strategy are not the same. And so when we talk about word of mouth and we talk about talk triggers, what we want is something that makes sense in the context of who you are and, and what you are. 
Consequently, the best talk triggers actually tie back to the master brand, like me and plaid suits or double tree, warm cookie, warm welcome, right? Th those are the best examples. And, and sometimes people say, well, let's just rent an elephant and walk it down Main Street. That'll create conversation. But yeah, it will. But the conversation is about the elephant, not about your business. So what have you really accomplished here? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of like, a, what's his name? Uh, John Laguerre of uh, T-Mobile and how mm -hmm. he uses right. the, the magenta Mm -hmm. idea. So, yes. I mean, not only is he creating something that people talk about, but it's it's very on brand and it keeps the brand top of mind whenever the conversation comes up. Yes, so absolutely. So, when people talk about him, they, they think magenta and that magenta leads back to T-Mobile as a product, right? Or as a, as a brand. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's a very smart branding decision. And, and there's a reason why our book, Talk Triggers, is is also that color similar shade and there's a reason why the book has alpacas on the cover right there's not a lot of business books that have whispering alpacas on the cover but it's <laughs> a book about word of mouth like it feels like it has to be somewhat uh, unusual otherwise you know would what, what do we accomplish here well you could have used unicorns i mean you know alpacas and unicorns <laughs> we could have. Turns out alpaca is like the animal of the moment, though. There's all kinds of new yeah, alpacas, right. which I did not know. It loves alpacas at the moment. <laughs> yep. Okay. The other thing is to be reasonable. Is it supposed to be reasonable or not? Yes. That was my yes. big question. Definitely reasonable. You don't want to overshoot it because what happens is we talked about the iPad thing. Here, here's the here's the other side of that coin. Company says, "Boy, we need to get some word of mouth. We need to get these customers talking about us. So let's do this." Okay, guys, here's the thing. Um, everybody put your name on a fishbowl, and one of you is going to win an island. <laughs> you're like, wait, what? That doesn't seem right. You know, they, 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 they figure that the only way you can get conversation is to, is to make it so big that it can't be ignored. And I understand why people go down that road, but it actually has the opposite effect. Mm -hmm. When your customer believes that there are strings, that there are terms and conditions, that there are limitations on the, the veracity of the offer, the conversation around you stops. It doesn't grow because I don't want to tell you about this thing if I think it's bogus. You know, experiences, experiences that are too grand, and this is true in all of CX, experiences that are too grand create suspicion, not conversation. So you, you, you want it to be reasonable. It, ha it has to be interesting enough to be noticed. But interesting doesn't necessarily mean big. And in fact, if you look through the book, and there's you know dozens and dozens and dozens of case studies in the book, all of the things in there are relatively modest. Nobody's given you a condo for a year, or here's your Mercedes. It's just little stuff that people notice. Mm -hmm. um, so you don't have to you don't have to overshoot it. But I have an exception. Okay. What if Virgin like gives away like um, when a chance to get shot into space? Mm -hmm. <laughs> It sounds insane, yep. but actually what they do. Yeah. <laughs> as absurd as so, it seems. Yeah, and and that is uh, in violation of the fourth principle, nice segue, which is that your talk trigger has to be repeatable. Right. So Vir Virgin's We're Going to Shoot You Into Space contest is an amazing public relations promotion. Sure, it is, a stunt. It is, it is not a word of mouth strategy. Mm-hmm. Because a word of mouth strategy, at least in our way of thinking, by definition, is something that could work every day for 30 years, like the chocolate chip cookie. You, you can't do the we're going to shoot you into space every day for 30 years. It creates a bunch of awareness over a short period of time. But then once that time passes, the effectiveness of that program decays over time. It's just like if you do a lot of paid Google search, right? So you're, you're paying Google, you're paying Google, you're paying Google. Every time somebody searches for a CX podcast, you're in the top five, then you stop paying them and now you disappear. Public relations promotions are, work the same way, right? There is a half-life of their effectiveness. And we are not at all suggesting that that's not a, not a viable way of communication. Of course it is. But that's not a talk trigger. That's not a word of mouth strategy. So like uh, by definition, a contest is not a talk trigger can't be mm -hmm. because it's not repeatable. So our, our approach is that a true talk trigger, a real word of mouth strategy, every customer has access to it. Mm -hmm. It's not just a contest. It's not just, you know, your best customers or your new customers or whatever. It's every customer every time. And that's why we, we, we really emphasize all the time that it really is an operational decision, not a promotional decision. 
Did you know that surveys don't actually have to be annoying in order to gather insight? Quit pestering your customers with old, bulky surveys that are hard to answer and hard to process. Welcome to the future of surveys. Simple, short, adaptive, meaningful. Learn more at worthix.com. That brings me into surprise and delight, which is a topic that I talk about often on this podcast. Mm -hmm. And quite a few times, your name has come up when when bringing up this topic Uh because of how you view surprise and delight. No, no, it's a good thing. We actually are kind of on the same page, right? So in customer experience, surprise and delight is kind of a divider of waters, right? You've got the sexers who, I mean, are passionate about surprise and delight and who make that their main strategy. And others are a slightly more skeptical. Mm-hmm. I, I call it at times ACX trap. That's what I call surprise and delight. Because if you're unable to do it repeatedly, then what you end up having is you create that expectation in your customer. And when they are frustrated, it leads to disappointment, which is a negative emotion associated with the experience. So... I'm, I, I believe very strongly that you, you should only surprise and delight if it's something that's replicable. That's, that's how I feel. I completely agree. We are aligned. Uh, I am not anti-surprise and delight, mm-hmm. but I would never roll out a surprise and delight program until I already have a talk trigger. I would, I would have a repeatable word of mouth strategy. Mm-hmm. And then if you want to lay some you know, additional surprisings and delightings on top of that, I'm cool with that. But most people don't do a word of mouth strategy because it's hard and they do a surprise and delight because it's comparatively easier and they feel like well we'll you know we'll just we'll just do something circumstantial and and our word of mouth problems are solved but it but they aren't because you're you're trying to push your word of mouth through a very narrow pipe at that point right it's trying to communicate through a straw and just like with your promotion uh, issue with the contest and being shot into space every surprise and delight has a half life you're not surprised forever nor are you delighted forever uh, and the sure. story around that doesn't last forever. And, and you know, we do a lot of work in travel and hospitality, and, and I'm always talking to our clients, and they're probably one of the industries that are most um, uh, enamored with surprise and light, right? You see it all the time. A guy, you know, checks in his hotel room, and you know, over in the hotel room, there's a, a live panda bear in the corner of his room, and there's a bamboo tree for it to eat, or eucalyptus, <laughs> whatever it is. And it's like, oh, my God, there's a bear here. And, and he puts it on Facebook, yeah. and then somebody puts it on Reddit, and then MSNBC calls, and now the hotel's famous. And I'm like, well, yeah. They go on the Ellen Show. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, you're right. Now, A, that might work. Or you just might have a hotel room with a bunch of panda shit in it. Like, you don't know. Like, so part of the problem is it's not controllable. Uh, right. And then every other guest of that hotel is like, hey, man, where's my bear? Exactly. And that's the biggest problem I have. When, when you treat customers inconsistently, it breeds contempt, not conversation. And, and as I talked about in the book, you may remember this chapter, I fly every week. And the, the, <laughs> this is where you see it violated most egregiously. I see it every week. You're boarding a plane. Mm-hmm. And other than Southwest, every carrier has 1,600 different boarding groups now. It is unbelievable. They're in double digits. Right? And if you're in boarding group one, as I often am because I fly so very much, you're like, mm-hmm. yeah, fantastic. Where's my nuts? But if mm-hmm. you're in boarding group 11 and you're getting on the plane with like dirty diapers and dry ice and human kidneys, you're like, I do not feel very <laughs> respected. And it's so bad. The CX is so broken that now they actually like they message it this way. Like every flight ever, right? You're in the boarding lounge. You're like, uh, <sighs> Welcome to uh, American Flight 26 from Indianapolis to JFK. We're in a fully sold out situation. So if you're in boarding group five or higher, there's literally no chance in hell your carry ons getting on this plane. So <laughs> why don't you just give it to me now and I'll give you a tiny piece of paper that you'll lose and we'll just all agree to disagree. This is how they, this is their strategy. This is literally how they have architected their customer experience to treat everybody differently. Now, obviously, they're putting a lot of time and a lot of algorithmic attention to that thinking, okay, we really need to cater to the business traveler, blah, 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 blah. So maybe they're right and maybe I'm wrong mathematically. But I got to tell you, spiritually, I think it's crazy. Yeah. Uh, it, is, it, is not, it, is, it is not a way I would run a business, put it that way. Well, I, I think, it, it, like you said, it creates resentment. And then you get that whole thing where it's like, 
the French Revolution and it's the plebs versus the aristocrats, you know, and, and you people get angry and they get bitter and it creates that negative emotion that you associate with the brand. I mean, I, I live in Atlanta, so I fly Delta all the time and, and Delta has been doing this thing now where they have, you know, they've got first class and they've got business and then they've got um, uh, business economy or, or, you know, comfort, comfort seats and then just regular economy. And now they have the sub economy group or in other words, like the worst of the worst or basically the shit because you're right next to the bathroom anyway, you know, so you're like, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Way back. and if you're there, I mean, you'll pay less. But when you're purchasing your ticket, they'll tell you like, you're paying dirt cheap. We're going to treat you like crap. But if you pay another $372, we can treat you like a normal person or we can treat you like a human being. Right. <laughs> For me, this is extremely complicated. because I understand that they want to, you know, increase their, their, their ticket. And I, I understand that they want to add value to more expensive products. But at the same time, it seems like a strategy that's going to backfire. I, I don't see it working. I don't know. That's just me personally being bitter, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I, it depends. On, I think it depends on what you consider to be working, right? So mm. they have taken so much capacity out of the airline system that it, your choice is more an illusion of choice in many cases now. Mm-hmm. You know, the prices are basically the same. There's not nearly as many routes, especially in smaller second, third tier uh, airports. And and so it's basically this is the CX like it or take a bus right so you know and that's why they say well look it's not really hurting our bottom line it's like well you haven't given anybody any choice sure uh, and so it, you know it's it's not like I can really complain about my water company either because what's my backup plan uh, I'm gonna shower in milk um, I mean mm-hmm. that sounds cool once so that, you know that's that's part of the challenges is that when when you're in a near monopolistic situation the the foibles of your own CX don't become readily apparent because you've got a false economy driving people's actual economic behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to talk a little bit about word of mouth strategies for B2B companies. Even more important Mm -hmm. than B2C. Uh, 91% of B2B company purchases are influenced by word of mouth. 91%. Nobody buys nothing without word of mouth input. Yet... (laughs) B2B companies are, by our research, even less likely to actually have a word of mouth strategy because they are constitutionally required to be boring. Um, And what's amazing, and we've got lots of B2B examples in the book, what's amazing about it is when B2B companies actually have the courage, and it does require a measure of courage, have the courage to actually do something interesting and build something into their customer experience that gets noticed, to actually pursue a talk trigger and a word of mouth strategy, holy cow. It works so well because nobody does anything like that in, in B2B. And you're like, wow, these guys, I'll give you an example that's not in the book that, that I think is so great that it's so easy. There's an accounting firm in Indianapolis called Bogdanoff and Dodges, a small accounting firm, two principals, Bogdanoff and Dodges. Um, and they do small business tax accounting, some personal tax accounting. There are literally tens of thousands of firms like that in the US. They have an incredible talk trigger, however. They have dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of Google reviews for a tiny accounting firm, which is crazy in and of itself. And every one of those reviews uh, are four or five stars. And if you do the data mining, you'll discover the talk trigger. And it is this. Bogdanoff and Dodges reply to every email and return every phone call from their clients within five minutes. Now, I have had a lot of accounting firms in my time, and some of them are quite good. But I have never had an accounting firm that calls me back in five minutes every time. Right. And if I did, you can damn well believe I'd be telling that story to all my friends. They have made an operational choice to do something that their customers don't expect, and they're reaping the rewards as a result. Mm -hmm. I think that people tend to forget that when you're selling to a business, you're not selling to a business, you're selling to a person. There's a person on the other side. I mean, there's a a building full of people. And... um, I I face a similar problem when people tell me that they don't do uh, social media efforts for B2B companies. And I say, you know, why the hell not? Oh, because, you know, brands aren't sensitive to social media. It's people. People are interested. And, And that's where you find people on social media. Why is it that marketers forget that they're still selling to people? I mean, it's... 
part of it's because we call it business to business, right? We start there. We sort of lead them, sort of them astray uh, in the very definition and, and uh, in the context of, of the conversation. Uh, and part of it is is that when you when you sell B two B, a lot of times you actually have multiple buyers, right? You've got you've got mm-hmm. several different people in the organization that are helping to make that buying decision. And so sometimes it's easier to just think of those people as a collective, as one entity, uh, as opposed to a collection of individuals that have their own perspectives and needs and pain points, etc. Um, to I guess to answer your question more cleanly, because to think of a business as a bunch of people is a lot of work. Okay. Well, yeah, that, that makes it easy to understand. It's laziness, <laughs> yeah, or or just or, or just not really having the the training um, to to do it okay. that way. Mm-hmm. And also, I think partially, um, you know, a whole show on this in the in a B two B environment. Usually, marketing is not the only game in town. Right. Usually, you have marketing and then you have sales. And so, what I see is that sometimes the marketers are like, "Look, our job is to kind of." light the match mm-hmm. it's sales job it's sales job to kind of stoke the fire so if anybody needs to understand the personal nature of this relationship it's the salesperson not the marketing department so marketing is sort of free freed up to to be thinking about um, those customers as as companies as opposed to as people mm-hmm. well do you think that this is something that has become your mission to change you know part of your tagline, you know, what you talk about in your company name is, you know, convert and uh, convince and convert, right? So mm-hmm. going that extra mile, is, is that something that, that you have made a, a conscious decision to do and change that mentality a bit? I, to some degree, for sure. I, I think our mission is to help people grow their businesses in ways that their competition probably hasn't thought of and in ways that are that are cost effective, right? So if you think about the books that I've written, uh, I wrote a book called The Now Revolution, which was about how to grow customers with social media. I wrote a book called Utility, which is about how to grow your business with content marketing. I wrote Hug Your Haters, which is a book about how to grow your business with customer service. And now Talk Triggers, which is about how to grow your business with word of mouth. So even though they all cover very different um, elements, the the core principle is the same, which is essentially money ball for marketing, right? As opposed to buying a bunch of ads and just coming at people straight on and saying, we've got some stuff, would you like to buy some? There's a better way, right? There's a more effective mm-hmm. way, there's a more cost-effective way. Uh, and, and all of those are uh, pieces of that of that story. Yeah. Well, let me ask you something. When What was it that sparked in you the interest to kind of dip your toes into the waters of customer experience? I think part of, part of it is that I have been fortunate to have been a consultant almost all my life. Right? I, I've worked with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies in every conceivable industry just about. And one of the things, really the only thing I'm actually good at is pattern recognition. Mm. Everything else is just details, but but I see patterns in data and in behavior naturally in a way that that some people just don't. I don't know how, but that's just what I'm good at. And ultimately, after being a consultant for so long, and, and both on the analog side and the digital side, I have come to the conclusion, and I started coming to this conclusion eight years ago, it took me that long to actually get talk triggers as a book and a system completed and, and on the shelf. But I came to the conclusion that ultimately, CX is all that matters. Hmm. Because CX trumps everything else. If If you have great marketing and terrible CX, you lose. Mm -hmm. If you have terrible marketing and great CX, you win. CX is the trump card, right? And all the data show that, right? Like Walker's new report says that by 2020, a majority of B2B buying decisions will be based on CX, not price. And we'll start to see the same thing happen in B2C. So so I just feel like, and you're starting to see this, I, just, I was talking to one of the big tech stack companies this morning and and their new messaging is around the same thing, right? That, that CX is the center of marketing and vice versa. Right? That would have been crazy. Mm-hmm. That would have been crazy to, for, for somebody at that size and scale to talk about two, three years ago, right? And now everybody is coming to that conclusion, which is if you don't have the CX right, nothing else matters. And how do you feel about this tendency of the the big SaaS companies, you know, creating their own CX metrics or their own uh, way of monitoring CX, CX cloud, CX experience, uh, you know, SAP purchasing Qualtrics, Qualtrics uh, purchasing the Temkin group and Mm -hmm. everyone kind of rushing 
towards getting their own version of CX. Some people in the space are concerned that CX is going to become the new CRM. In other words, bundled up in a package and sold as SaaS, as software as a service. Do you think this is going to happen? If it is going to happen, do you see this as a bad thing? Uh, I do think it will happen. Absolutely. Because it's an, ex- it's, it's an existential question for the SaaS platforms, mm-hmm. right? They're starting to understand that what I just said is true, that CX is the most important thing. Like you can be the best in the world at sending emails, but if the CX that, that lies behind those emails sucks, then it doesn't matter how good your email is. So there's mm-hmm. no question that, that they are going to try to turn CX and are trying to turn CX into uh, a product line and a service line. Um, it is an existential question for them. And and given that it is tens of billions of dollars at stake, yeah, that's that's absolutely what we're going to see. But it takes two to tango, right? Just because SaaS platforms say this is what CX means doesn't mean it does mean that. It just means that that's what they think it means. And, and I would say that, that the same is true for individual CX practitioners or, or marketers or, or customer service professionals or ops professionals or anything else. While I think it's a net positive if people want to try and measure CX better and put more ROI around CX, there's always been a bit of a bugaboo. I think that's good for everybody. But you know, you can define CX in your own organization the way you choose to. Mm-hmm. You don't you don't have to adhere to 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 Oracle's definition or Salesforce's or Adobe's or IBM's or SAP's or mine or yours. You know, and, and what I will tell you is that the most effective CX professionals, in my estimation and in my observation, are those that create a highly customized, highly relevant CX program in their own organization that meets the goals and mores and cultural expectations of that organization. I, I think more so than marketing, CX defies a cookie cutter approach. And I think we'll we'll start to run up against that here pretty soon. In the next 18 to 24 months, people will start to realize like, oh, great, we have all these CX platforms and systems and software and metrics, but it's not quite as easy to say, here's the quote unquote best practices for CX in the same way that you would say, here's quote unquote the best practices for Instagram. Right. You said that word of mouth isn't necessarily a marketing strategy. Is it a CX strategy? I think it's really an operational imperative and as a practical matter, increasingly CX is the driver of that or at least a kiss and cousin to that initiative. So when we actually work with clients on talk trigger development, we do it all the time. We talk about this methodology in the book as well. It really does require a, a Noah's Ark approach, right? We call it the triangle of awesome that, that you've got people from sales, people from service, people from CX, if you have a dedicated CX department people from ops, people from service, everybody has to be on board because your talk trigger, your word of mouth strategy will impact every department. And so everybody's got to be, if it's not the kind of thing you're like, hey, sales, congratulations, we're doing this thing now because they they will freak, right? Everybody has to be bought in. And that buy-in is, is a big part of making it work. Awesome. Well, Jay, I think that Customer experience as an industry is really lucky to have you on board and joining us and and kind of getting these ideas out there. Um, We are absolutely out of time, but what are some ways that our listeners can follow your work? Where can they find your book? Where can they watch you speak? Uh, The book is available all the places and ways that books can be procured. The book is called Talk Triggers. As mentioned, it's hot pink with alpacas on the cover, so it's hard to miss. It's currently (laughs) in all the major airports and train stations and such in the U.S., so if you're in an airport, you can probably find it there. You can also get it on uh, on the online booksellers, of course, also as an audio book read by Daniel and myself. TalkTriggers.com is the main site for the book, which includes uh, links to purchase it, of course, but also a ton of free resources. So there's discussion guides for group work. There's PowerPoint presentations if you want to pr- uh, produce this and talk to uh, your team about it. There's infographics, videos, research. There's all kinds of stuff at TalkTriggers.com, all of it for free. I will also say that the book itself has a talk trigger, not only the alpacas, but on the back of the book, it says, Satisfaction Guaranteed. If you buy this book and you don't and you don't love it unconditionally, send the authors a note. That's me, and they will buy you any other book of your choosing. And that's true. We will. So if you don't like it, uh, I think you will. But if you don't, uh, you want like a first edition Bible or something, we'll we'll figure it out. We'll we'll make something happen. So you have no risk uh, in uh, in your purchase <laughs> of Talk Triggers. The risk has been removed. So go get yourself a copy. Tell your friends, and then all the rest of the stuff that we do is at convinceandconvert.com. 
that's uh, my main online home. My podcast, Social Pros, is there. We have 5,000 articles now at convincegiver.com about CX, marketing, content marketing, social media marketing, et cetera. Uh, that's the place to go, convincegiver.com. And in terms of speaking, I'm, I'm always everywhere. It's, uh, it's pretty easy to find me out there. A quick, uh, quick Google search or my speaking website is jbear.com. Great. Thank you so much. I can't thank you enough for coming on, Jay. And next time I catch you in an event, I'll walk up to you and shake your hand. Please do. Make that happen. <laughs> awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Thank you for joining us on one more episode of Voices of Customer Experience. This podcast is hosted and produced by Mary Drummond, edited and co-produced by Nick Gomez and Steve Barry. This podcast was brought to you by Worthix. Discover your worth at worthix.com.